pretty awesome preview of all the different names of God. So welcome. welcome. It's great to have everybody here. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. So Amen. we're glad to have you here with us today, whether you're here in person or online. And for those who are out traveling today, we ask a special blessing on you guys for safe travel as well. Hey, we had a great meeting uh, this week and, and we were kind of got out the crystal balls and we were looking into the future and everything trying to figure out what all fun stuff we had coming up and uh so orange track racing we had uh orange track here yesterday so we converted it into the racetrack and and had a really good time and uh that was the second to the last race of the year so our last race comes up here in november and that's kind of the final so that's that's where everybody comes in and all the cars that have won the different categories throughout the year. Everybody has race offs and it's a, it's a really great time. So hopefully you can make it for that. That movie night we have coming up, we're going to see the Christmas Angel. And that comes to us on November 20th. And uh, so kind of pumped up for that one there. That should be fun. And, and I think there's going to be the mention of somebody. I think they were going to make uh, Christmas cookies and have them here as well and who knows maybe even hot chocolate those kind of things might show up too um, but we are also talking about uh, having a an outreach project or service project uh, for thanksgiving and possibly one at christmas time so you got a lot of kind of things and if you would like to contribute or come in and be a part of that we uh, invite you to do that and then starting on december 1st we have an advent study which is from lee strobel which is a case for Christmas. And so that'll be a four week series each Wednesday night. And we're looking forward to having that. And then we also talked about Christmas Eve candlelight service. So plan ahead for that. The time for that's gonna be announced a little bit later on, but I uh, just wanted to kind of give everybody a heads up of what we got going on here at Gray Street. A lot of fun things coming up and uh, a lot of things that you can get active in and participate in and uh, show God what wonderful things we can do in this community. Let's go to God in prayer, shall we? Gracious Lord and Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity to gather here together in your name today, freely and openly, to worship you. Thank you, Lord God, for the blessings that you give us each and every day, for the life and love that you've given us to share with one another, and for reaching out to us and putting it on our hearts to reach out to others in your name to be your hands and feet and to be a blessing to others as we journey through our lives today. so lord we just ask in this worship time today that you would just simply speak to our hearts and talk to us and, and give us the message that you need us to hear individually today we thank you for all of these blessings and the opportunity to gather here together in song and in worship today. In your precious and holy name we pray. <coughs> thank you, Pastor Mark getting us started today. We do love you, Lord. We ask that you would send the advocate of the Holy Spirit to dwell here amongst us today and always. Heavenly Father, we thank and praise you for new beginnings, for a fresh start each day. We thank you, Lord, that when we find ourselves in the depths of sorrow, you match it with your great joy and your great comfort. We find that when we need to seek the most, you're already here to comfort and love us and care for us. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the folks that are watching online today. They're part of who we are. They're part of our church, your holy church, the greater church, all of our believers, in you, Jesus. And we just give you all the praise, honor, and glory. Amen. Oh, we're going to have fun with this first song, I hope. Um, the uh, 
uh, another worship pastor, worship friend of ours, uh, once uh, labeled being a worship pastor as being in charge of recess. <laughs> because we like to have a lot of fun. We like to praise Jesus. <laughs> Sometimes we're in our weakest, he finds another another way to use us. It's just a great example. Let it ride. 
Thank you for your music this morning. It always lifts me up and gets me ready for worship. And so as we go into our call to worship this morning, Pastor Terry has chosen a verse from Isaiah 53, 4 through 6. And it says, Yet I would, it was our weakness he carried, it was our sorrows that weighed him down. And we thought his troubles were a punishment from God, a punishment for his own sins. But he was pierced for our rebellion, crushed for our sins. He was beaten so we could be made whole. He was whipped so that we could be healed. All of us like sheep have strayed away. We have left God's past to follow our own. Yet the Lord laid on him the sins of us all. So when we think about this, when this was written and and some biblical scholars attribute this to King Hezekiah and some attribute it to the later writings of Isaiah. But if we think about this in Old Testament times, how could an Old Testament person understand the idea of Christ dying for our sins and actually bearing the punishment that we deserve? We deserve. See, these sacrifices suggest this idea it is one thing to kill a lamb, but yet it's another thing, quite something different, to think of God's chosen son, his servant, Jesus, as that lamb. So what God was doing, he was kind of pulling aside the curtains of time to let people of Isaiah's day look ahead to the suffering of the future Messiah and the resulting forgiveness that was made for all people all peoples. And this passage in Isaiah was written at approximately 715 BC, 715 years before Christ was born. And it's one of the most controversial portions and chapters of the Bible. The Jewish rabbis claim that this is not the foretelling of a Messiah, but merely the struggles of the people of Israel. But to Christians, it is that foretelling of our Savior to come. It's a very important glimpse into God's heart, into the heart of God, and how much He loves us. Yes, we endure trials. Yes, we endure heartbreak as we take our journey through this life, but nothing close to what Jesus endured for the sins of us all. Our scars that we are produced as we journey through this life are reminders of what God has brought us through. What he's brought us through. But see, we have this promise that these scars won't remain. They, like our life here on earth, are temporary. When we are raised to be with God in his presence, we are made new. We are given new bodies, a new life, a new birth. Thanks be to God for his mercies. Let us pray. God of mercy, we welcome you here this morning. Pour out your spirit upon us and help us to understand your perfect will for our lives. We welcome you into our hearts today and to bless us with your wisdom. Thank you for the message that you've given Pastor Terry to share with us today and for the blessings it will bring into our lives. Open our ears to hear and our eyes to behold your glory and our hearts to receive you today. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. 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 The reference to the sermon title, The Scars Remain, goes to a... a a group that I really love listening to. It's a Christian rock, hard rock group. Uh, Beckham Love <laughs> By the name of Disciple. They've been around for years. And the song was written back in the, uh, about 2010, 2011. And it is, it's, there's a hard driving beat behind it. And, and but it, the message is that the, the scars do remain. See, the thing is, is life is painful been there, done that, have a membership, bought the book, 
watch the movie. We all have scars. And here's the thing. Some of them are seen. Like, I have one on my knee. There's one there. And some are unseen. But each one of them tells a story. Now, there's a story uh, about my scars. It's my knee versus some gravel. And that is pretty close to the bike I was riding. And I guarantee you that that road is the road I was riding down. So if you follow the little red arrow, I was coming down the hill. This is gravel. It was very loose gravel. I had a speedometer on my bike. I was doing 30 miles an hour coming down that hill. I was trucking and I turned into that driveway. The beauty of the handlebars is, is when you stop and hit a, when you hit a rut and you, the bike stops, you go launching out in between the handlebars. Right about there, I ripped a gash in my knee like that. That is a quarter mile lane. Mom and dad were at the house. I walked my bike up the lane. The blood draining or dripping down my leg and I get into the house and mom takes one look at it. She goes and she grabs, cleans it up and no stitches, band-aids. <laughs> she pushed that together and she band-aided it up and she kept it uh, clean and, and she worked on it. And now that scar that I used to be able to show people is barely visible. In all those years, it's barely visible now. I've got to thank Google Earth for having a picture of the road for me. There used to be a house up here. I mean, so much has changed out there. Um, and just like in our lives, things change. And I used to tell everybody about that scar. I thought I was so proud of that scar for some reason. <laughs> And here's the thing, it, it wasn't that I was uh, sharing that I was probably not the brightest for coming down that, but I, I talked to people about safety when they're riding their bikes and coming down a hill, slow down before you make a turn. I used it at, you know, what, seven, eight years old, I was able to use, take that and use it as a message about what I had learned. And that's the whole thing with today's message about the scars remain. We have, there's a message in there. We all talk about the test we have in our lives and how that test turns into testimony. If you've got your Bibles, join me in Galatians chapter 6. And this is, this is uh, at the very end of this chapter. In fact, Paul even writes at the beginning of this passage, uh, he says, notice what large letters I use as I write these closing words in my own handwriting. He made the scribe, he said, give me that pen. Or, I'm going to write this myself because this is that important. And then in verse 14, he says this. He says, as for me, me, I never boast about anything except the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because of that cross, my interest in this world has been crucified. And the world's interest in me has also died. It doesn't matter whether we have been circumcised or not. What counts is whether we have been transformed into a new creation. May God's peace and mercy be upon all who live by this principle. They are the new people of God. From now on, don't let anyone trouble me with these things, for I bear on my body the scars that show I belong to Jesus. As he often does, he has just finished up warning the Galatians about the motivation of those who are teaching a false gospel. A very self-serving motivation. Now, it's kind of like we were talking before service and Mark's got, uh, there's a, a sermon series that, or a series that he wants to get, and it's about the end times. <clears throat> but it's not a uh, hurry up and send me the money type series because that way we could do more ministry it's it's a warning that um, the end times are coming and each day we're one day closer 
And for some of us, it's closer than others because we don't know what's going to happen in two minutes. Bless you. We don't know what's going to happen in an hour. We don't know what happens when we hop in the car we drive to go see a family member. We just don't know. And so it's about making sure everyone knows what's coming and that really, uh, yeah, life and, and, and the sin of life, and boy, it sure seems like a lot of fun at the time, but I have in my lifetime, I was in that area of my life. I, I walked, I, I went through my desert time as we've talked about. But when we come out of that, we see that there's so much more in God. See, these, these uh, false teachers have placed an emphasis on proving one's holiness, in this case, by being circumcised or by doing something. You know, when we take communion each week, we always talk about this is not just something we do to do because it's just do it. It's, there's meaning behind it. And when you listen to the, the communion meditation today, listen to what Pastor Mark has to say because it's so much more than just, oh, well, we got the bread, we got the cup, let's do this and get it over with. There's meaning behind it and there's so much more. So. We can't focus on the legalistic side of things. They were focusing on circumcision and they were forgetting, literally the rest of the Jewish laws, they were cherry picking what they wanted to be the important thing. And you will often maybe hear someone preaching a message and they're cherry picking so that the message that they're giving out of the scriptures matches what they wanted to. They make it their belief instead of what God has to say. And, and even today, we, we hear people pick and choose one thing or another as a measure of their faith. I read the Bible every day. That's a measure of their faith. They may read it every day, but they certainly don't. Out of that 20 or 30 minutes after they've read that Bible, that means nothing because they go out and do something completely different. Do as I say, not as I do. And then they condemn others for what they do, forgetting about their own sins. You know, that whole log in your own eye type thing? They're, they're, it's where they're at. And in this case, as they focus on one thing, they forget the entirety of what this book is teaching us, what it has, the message in it is for us. And they're so much worried about their own personal reputation. You know, it's, it's, I'm not going to stand on that chair. I'm not going to get up on a pedestal because that's what they do. They're putting themselves up on a pedestal. And that's what, and, and other people prop them up there and hold them up there. And guess what? They fall. We all fall short. But when they fall, they fall a little further because they, they're up on that pedestal. And it's more noticeable. Paul's motivation has nothing to do with his own personal reputation. He doesn't care about his own personal reputation. He knows where he came from. He knows he was one of the guys, he was holding the, the coats of the men that stoned Stephen. He knows that he was going and taking letters from the Jewish leaders and going after Christians and bringing them back and putting them in jail and even having them killed. He knew all of that, and so he knew it wasn't about his own reputation. He knew it was about God's glory. It's not about what the world thinks. Worldly things are no longer attractive or inviting to the people of God. Now, this is difficult to do because there's a constant barrage of what the world thinks we should find valuable and follow. Just I say this all the time, turn on the TV, open a magazine, open a newspaper, hop on the internet. And there are times when we all feel the pull of that destructive influence. It's not hard to feel that pull. But to escape it, we have to ask God to crucify our interests in the world. 
And this is what transforms us into that new creation that he was writing about. Back in Colossians, or in Colossians 2.19, Paul tells us that he quit trying to meet all the requirements of us so that he could live for God. And this is what it says in Galatians 2.20, just a little bit before the passage that we read earlier. It says, My old self has been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. So I live in this earthly body by trusting in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. But here's the problem. We go back that we're all susceptible to the world. We're all susceptible to fall into that trap. I just imagine... So, we've accepted Jesus as our Lord and Savior, and now we find ourselves as children of God, and, and we label, give ourselves that label of Christian. So imagine we've got that physical sign on the front of our shirt. But then all of a sudden you're walking down, and all of a sudden you see some friends. Or family. Or it's your job. Or on social media, just being out in public and cover that up. Because heaven forbid we should be called out for our faith. We get scared to show it for so many reasons. Because we don't want to lose those friends. Uh, that popularity that comes into play. We don't want to lose that. We don't want to lose our relationships, our family, or our job because of our faith. I remember the first day I started at uh, my current job some 11 years ago. I w I've worn this since I, I got it back in, I think 2005, 2006, and promise keepers and didn't want. And I walked in and I looked at the trainer because I knew some of the, the, I'd read up about the culture of the business and I wanted to know more. And I walked in, I looked at the trainer and I said, is it okay? if I wear this. He said, that's part of our culture. Everyone is different. That is yours. That is who you are. You are more than welcome to wear that. And so I, have, I work, work proudly. It may have had a big difference on whether I had to stay there or not. But God has been good, and I've been able to share my faith with others there and be there for folks who needed prayer and things of that nature. This is kind of what happened to Peter, though. He was walking around with that Christian sign. He was out with the Gentiles, and he was in their homes, and he was eating with them, and he was speaking with them. But then his friends showed up. What did, what did he do? Peter went like this. He covered it up. He stopped what he was doing in reaching out to the Gentiles for fear of being criticized by his friends. This is dangerous. It led other Christians, including <coughs> Barnabas. And if you know Barnabas, if you remember Barnabas, he's an encourager. He was one to, he just wanted to tell it, but he even caused Barnabas to be led astray because of this dishonesty. See, people, just like Peter, we stumble. We have to. We've got to remember that we cannot be afraid to live for God. We have to ask God for forgiveness. But our past, the scars of our past, both internal and external, God, they still show. What now? Well, yeah. But Jesus died so those scars from our past can become our testimony. There's something that you have been through in your life. There's a, 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 a season in your life that you've gone through that God allowed you to go through so that you could turn around and help someone else. I know seasons from most of your lives. 
and I have seen you take what you learned in that season to help one of God's children. Now, Louis Giglio, who was a pastor, said this. He said, don't let the enemy define you by your scars when Jesus wants to define you by his. See, lots of people, Christian or not, they live good, good lives by all outward appearances. The wolf in sheep's clothing, if you will. We've all been taken to task by someone who appears just wonderful until you get behind closed doors. And then they wound us and we end up with some new scars. Being a new creation is about an, the inward condition of our heart. See, to be transformed into a new creation, we have to let God work in our lives. When we do that, let's go to 2 Corinthians 2.14, where Paul writes, He canceled the record of the charges against us and took it away by nailing it to the cross. He literally went to the cross and wiped our slate clean. Yeah, we still have the scars. But we have been transformed into that new creation. And, and when you look at this passage, the record of charges, at that time, a certificate of indebtedness was actually written by the debtor. So to them, the, in saying this, it's, it's like being able to erase your own what you were written down. Jesus took and erased that. Think of the big, uh, most of you might remember from when we were kids, and we actually used pencils in school. Those giant pink erasers. He just erased it. And unlike the paper that we were erasing, you could still see a little bit about what you wrote. He made that paper as white as snow. Galatians 4, 4 says, But when the right time came, God sent his son, born of a woman, subject to the law. See, Jesus was subject to the demands and curses of the law. Jesus would go on to, to go to the cross, and he would take the sins of the world upon, us, upon himself. Yes, he went to the garden and he said, Father, not your, not my will, but yours. But he also, he also asked if it was his will to take it from him. But he didn't. He, and he didn't. And this is the thing we have to remember. He's taking the sins of the world upon him, and he didn't play victim. By dying on the cross, he set us free. In the passage that Mark read for the call to worship this morning, Isaiah 53, 4, 6, which I'm going to ask for forgiveness because I have a 454 up there instead of 53. Yet it was our weakness he carried, it was our sorrows that weighed him down. By coming into this world, by being born of a woman, subject to the law, he carried and went through each and everything that we did. He just wasn't led into that temptation. He was able to resist it. But our, it weighed him down. And he, we thought his troubles were punishment from God. We thought God was punishing Jesus when he was taking the punishment for us. It goes on and says, but he was pierced for our rebellion, crushed for our sin. He was beaten so we could be whole. He was whipped so we can be healed. All of us, like sheep, have strayed away. We have all left God past to follow our own. Yet the Lord laid on him the sins of us all. I know I can speak for Mark and, and, and Bruce here. It breaks our hearts when people don't believe. And it breaks our hearts when people fall away. But people get to that point where 
they don't, it's like they don't see any other way. Some scars are so deep that, that people just can't see Jesus or how Jesus can be in it or how Jesus can be real because of the wounds that they have. Why then is it so easy for people to believe something they see or hear on the internet or on TV or from a friend that as you know, we've got that whole new term now, fake news. So easy to remember that or to go with that, but to believe in Jesus. In the next passage we're going to go through in John 20, it's one of the the 12 times that Jesus would appear after he was crucified. So he would appear six times in Jerusalem, four times in Galilee, one on the Mount of Olives, and one on the road to Damascus. But this time was after he had already shown himself to the disciples and the, and the other believers, but Thomas wasn't there. This goes back to how hard it is for people to believe in him. And Thomas wanted proof. He wanted proof that Jesus was alive. Have you ever been at that point in your walk where you said, hmm, I wonder if Jesus really is alive? Maybe you wanted to touch him. Maybe you wanted to hear him speak like Thomas did. This is what John chapter 20, verses 24 through 29 says about it. It says, One of the twelve disciples, Thomas, nicknamed the twin, was not with the others when Jesus came. They told him, We have seen the Lord. Can you imagine? You walk in and say, We've seen the Lord. It's like, yeah, right. <laughs> sure, yeah. You're just you're just telling me that because I wasn't here. But he replied, I won't believe it unless I see the nail wounds in his hands, put my fingers into them, and place my hand into the wound in his side. About eight days later, the disciples were together again, and this time Thomas was with them. The doors were locked, but suddenly, as before, Jesus was standing among them. Peace be with you, he said. Then he said to Thomas, see, he already knew what Thomas had said, what Thomas was thinking. He said, put your finger here and look at my hands. Put your hand into the wound in my side. Don't be faithless any longer. Believe. Thomas says this. He says, my Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, you believe because you have seen me. Blessed are those who believe without seeing me. Now we have to remember that just because Thomas doubted doesn't mean that he wasn't loyal to the other disciples or the other believers, that he wasn't loyal to Jesus. He just had questions. Doubt leads to questions. I mean, it just does. When you doubt something, it's like, did I lock the house before we left? Did I turn off the oven? Did I unplug the iron? Not many people iron anymore. Everything comes with you know, wrinkle-free. Did I do this? Did I do that? We left out our garage one day and we came back, the front door was open. Forgot to shut the front door and lock it. I didn't even think about it that day, as so at one time I didn't doubt it. I just assumed it. But when we get to those questions, questions do what? Questions lead to answers. We saw a movie uh, last year, Case for Christ, with Lee Strobel. It's about his life. Here's the thing, though. He had no doubt that Jesus did not exist. In fact, he was so positive that Jesus didn't exist that he launched an investigation to prove to his wife, beyond a shadow of a doubt, that Jesus wasn't real. That Jesus was not the Messiah, that Jesus was not the Savior of the world. But as he went through that process, asking those questions, in his assuredness that this was not true, all of a sudden, he started to have doubts of his long beliefs. And he ended up getting answers to his questions 
that he refused to believe. Yet his wife kept praying for him. And I love the prayer that his wife prayed for him because it comes right from Ezekiel 36, 25 through 27. And she prayed this for him daily. Then I will sprinkle clean water on him and you will be clean. Your filth will be washed away and you will no longer worship idols. And I will give you a new heart and I will put a new spirit in you. And I will take out your story or stony, stubborn heart and give you a tender, responsive heart. And I will put my spirit in you so that you will follow my decrees and be careful to obey my regulations. You see, Jesus gave Thomas what he needed so he would believe. God used Lee's wife's faith to lead him into believing. Thomas then lost the stubbornness of his unbelief, and Thomas received that new heart, and he believed, just like it said here. And when Jesus said to Thomas, you believe because you have seen me, blessed are those who believe without seeing me. He was pointing to the generations that would come who would believe yet not see. We don't physically see Jesus, the man. He could manifest himself at any time to any one of us. In fact, there are stories, true stories of him manifesting himself to people all over the world beyond what's recorded in the Bible. He's manifested and showed himself to Muslims, to non-believers of all kinds, all over the world, helping them to understand who he is and to believe. His death on the cross washed away our sins and their sins. Just because people don't believe doesn't mean that their sins haven't been washed away, but they have to turn to Jesus. Lee came to grips with the truth and no longer could deny it. He, along with all of us, had been given a new heart and a new spirit, the Holy Spirit. And because of this, we are recipients of God's love, mercy, grace, and forgiveness. Now here's the thing, I get it. It's hard to move past the wounds that we've had in our lives. We may have gone through physical or emotional abuse. We may have experienced a loss. We may have been in a tragic accident. We may, it may be conflict of some sort. Here's the thing. Those things don't make you any less of, of God's child than you think. I, I'm going back to Mark's devotion yesterday. I, those things don't make you junk. We're not junk because, as Mark said in the devotional yesterday, God doesn't make junk. Now, Yes, some of those wounds, they will require help from others. Don't think you can get through it completely on your own. Oh, and uh, P.S., God will help you find the right people to help you. God will put the right people in your life to help you. Now, when we go to get that help, we have to open ourselves up. We have to be transparent. Yeah, like I said, remember when I talked about Jesus in the garden? He, when he was praying to God, he wasn't playing victim. We, we can't do that. We can't play the victim. Doing that will prevent us from getting the healing that we need. We are a new creation because God heals our past. And that healing of our past it depends on us leaving the past in the past. It means taking all that garbage, putting it at the foot of the cross, and walking away, and not going back to pick it up. It means that those scars that we have, they will heal. And over time, those scars will start to disappear. And when we meet our Father in Heaven, they will be completely gone. We will be made perfect in Him. But whether that scar is from an accident on a bike, because you know you just weren't paying attention to what you were doing, 
or something that someone said to you because, by the way, words hurt. They cut deep, sometimes deeper than a piece of gravel in a knee. God can help you to heal. God can make you whole again. And folks, He never lets go. He's holding on tight. I have to... You, 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 I, I think of uh, a story I read about this mom who uh, her son was swimming out in the lake that's down in Florida and um, she's standing up ways away from the shore and she's watching her son swim and all of a sudden she sees an alligator swimming towards him. And she screams out to him and he turns around and he's swimming back and he gets to the dock and just as she grabs hold of him, so does the alligator. Catches his legs and his jaw. And she is holding on for dear life. And you got to imagine, Mama Bear came out. She was holding on. She was not going to let go. And then a stranger came along and, and shot the alligator. And so the gator let go. This young man had scars up and down his legs. And when he gets to the hospital, the doctor asks him about the scars on his arm. He said, those it's my mom, and I let him go. So I have to imagine, I wonder what the scars look like of God not letting go of us because he loves us that much. He cares about us that much. That he holds on with everything that he has. Once our wounds have healed, they will become your testimony. A testimony of your faith in God, a testimony of God's amazing love for you, His amazing grace that He has given you, His amazing mercy, and His amazing forgiveness. Because, folks, I don't deserve His forgiveness. I don't deserve any of that, but yet He loves us that much. He holds on that tight. He loves us that much. <clears throat> Our wounds heal. even though the scars remain. Are you willing? Are you willing to share your scars that remain? And be like Paul and boast about the cross of Christ. Father God, scars do remain. But because of your great love, your great mercy, your grace, and your forgiveness, those wounds are healed. You never let go, Father. Let us turn to you. Let us run to you. Let us shout from the tops of the buildings, from the tops of the mountains, wherever it is, Father, let us not be ashamed to tell people about you and how amazing you are and what you have done in our lives. Thank you for letting us be your children. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Pastor Terry. So as we come into this time of communion, it's a reminder, it's to serve as a reminder of God's love, His grace, and His mercy. So I have a question for you today. You know, how many of you are saved by God's grace? How many of you claim the salvation of God? Prove it. How do you prove it? You prove it by living out the life that Christ has given to you. A life of servanthood. A life that shows grace, mercy, and love for everyone else. For everyone. <clears throat> See, that's what this is. This is a reminder of God's grace, God's mercy, and God's love. Because, as I said in that call to worship, he put his son on the cross for us, for our sins. 
for our iniquities, for our downfalls. He put Jesus on trial for us. Jesus bore our sins on the cross. His body was literally slashed and torn. That's what this represents. The body of Christ broken for you. Now likewise, as his body was broken and he was slashed and beaten, his blood poured out for all. And that blood washes away our sins, our iniquities, and covers us with his grace. The blood of Christ shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Each time we eat of that bread and drink of the cup, we're reminded of that sacrifice that he made for us, that God put out there for us, his one and only son, who died for us to make us clean so that we could have salvation. How do you prove that out in your life each and every day? As Terry was saying, he, he wears a cross just like I do. And I've got another one under here that never comes off. 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. This is an outward sign of my inward commitment to God. That I believe that he saved me from my sins, which are many. The body of Christ broken for you. The blood of Christ shed for you. Amen. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Lord of all, we just come before you today and we humble ourselves before you. We humble ourselves before your mighty acts of grace, your mighty acts of mercy, your mighty acts of love. Help us to go forth into the world and, and to let others know that they don't have to suffer under their scars. They don't have to play into the world and the problems of the world because through you and in you, you have rose us up above the world. You have removed those stars. You have brought us through those trials. You have looked past our iniquities and you have washed our sins clean by your death on the cross. Help us to show each and every day that we appreciate, that we acknowledge that love ultimate act of healing for us through your death on the cross. Thank you, Lord God. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. This is the time where we come together in prayer for uh, our church family, for all those who, uh, we, have a, we have a list each week that we pray, and we pray a lot of times we pray it in our homes, but corporately we pray it, pray it together on Wednesday nights, and I think Terry told me at one time it's up to five or six pages, but they're not all just petitions, through this we have we have so many blessings that have been answered prayers, uh, but we, we will never give up our prayer time. We're girded in prayer. It's part of who we are. And so today we have members traveling. Um, we have some still in the grips of COVID or, or the aftermath. We, we have hurts, we have pains, we have sorrow, but we have great joy also. Uh, we lift up uh, Danny. Uh, we miss you, Danny, if you're watching. We, uh, 
we lift up back you who watch us so many times, uh, so faithful to uh, to join us on Sunday mornings. Uh, we lift up uh, Jesse, who I picked up earlier, but we know your life has struggles and issues, and we're, we're your family, and we love you. Uh, we lift up Pastor Mark, who's whose busy time has him running again now. Uh, we lift up Pastor Terry, who gave such an awesome, awesome message today. Uh, and communion time right into the end of the message like that, Pastor Mark. Um, uh, and there's a, there's a response I want to give to the message and to... Uh, to the communion, and it's in it's in Second uh, Corinthians also. If you are in Christ, you are a new creation. Behold, everything has become new. So if if we didn't just take the little wafer and the little cup, if we didn't just take that into our bodies, but if we took that into our hearts, then we believe that we are forgiven. That each week we can be made anew. Heavenly Father, that each week you give us another chance. How many people that worship other gods around the world could say that their God would give them a new chance? Constantly, we screw up. What an awesome, awesome God we serve. Oh, you're righteousness, but it's only my 
So this week I have, I have not, I, it's not fair to say I, I've been struggling with this week, better, better I, but uh, our family's lost a baby this week, and uh, I've been trying to come up with every excuse that I can because I don't want to go to the funeral in Texas. I don't want to give up the baby and I don't want to go. But through Jesus sending the love of my wife saying I have to go, and through being convicted today during the service, and and the words that God gave to Terry and Mark after the service, we're gonna go get ready and we're gonna to go to Texas. And we're going to bury the baby, but what better arms, what other arms would you want to have the baby to? So, through my weakness and through my tears, I want to testify to Jesus Christ because he is the only answer, the only way I'll ever see that baby again is through accepting his love and his mercy and his forgiveness. Now it's hard to go from tears to joy, but we're going to do that. I love this song. Stand up, enjoy it, have fun with it. I'm going to. Oh, yeah. 
Some wisdom from my wife. Where you are today is no accident. God is using the situation you are in right now to shape you and prepare you for the place He wants you or wants to bring you in tomorrow. Trust Him with his plan even though you don't understand it and this is why Joshua chapter 1 verse 9 and this is what I send you out with this is my command be strong and courageous do not be afraid or discouraged for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go and I would add whatever you are going through he will bring you through by the blood of the Lamb Father God thank you for this day of worship this time of worship Father thank you for the people who have joined us both online and in person Father Thank you for the people that will be listening to this message until your son returns. Thank you for this ministry, Father. Thank you for the godly people that you have placed here. Father, help us to reach the world through your word. Not ours, not what we wanted to say, but your word, Father. And no matter what we're going through, whether we have to go somewhere we don't want to go to attend a funeral for a little baby. You are there with us, Father. And you will bring glory and blessing through it. And I thank you that because of Bruce's faith, he will see that grandchild again. I thank you that by your grace, your mercy, your love, and your forgiveness, that we can get through any trial that the devil wants to throw at us. And we can turn all those tests into testimony for who you are. In Jesus' name. Well, I've been reading. Ah! Uh -huh.